but I think about NFL combine kids that, you know, I've watched, I've been around the combine for about a decade now, and it's always interesting to see the different approaches to the 225 bench press. Now, undoubtedly, you know, you see 300 of the best athletes going into Indianapolis, Lucas Oil Stadium. It's the same dog and pony show. And every one of them has well-developed pecs, especially the guys who have big bench presses. And you bring up something super interesting, and it kind of comes back to like, uh, you know, the, the idea of bottlenecks, like what is actually slowing us down and the idea of momentum and the interset or interrep uh, recovery. And it's something that you see because you'll see you know, guys who get into powerlifting, lose their hair, get into strength and conditioning, and they start to teach the bench press through the physiology of a fat old retire, retired powerlifter, not understanding the metabolic capacity of the engine that they're getting to bench press because you see that rep speed and you've seen it go, go off the rails. Like, you, you know, you, I've seen people, you, plenty, plenty of people in preparation or heard stories of them tearing their pack and, you know, position related and all that. Like, it's not an ideal exercise to test the skill of a, a football player by any stretch of the imagination, but it's not going anywhere. And it's funny that you mentioned that, like, hey, they're generating, a, you know, a ton of force out of the bottom of that rep to recover a little bit more because the velocity isn't any detriment to their baseline ability to metabolically recover into rep because they're monsters, right? They're that they have such, they have such big engines. Talked a little bit about tension. And, you know, I think one of the things that catapulted the hypertrophy world forward was the, the attempt to collect the three figureheads, the uh, Mount Rushmore, of of hypertrophy stimulus, right? The Schoenfeld study years ago that outlined mechanical tension, muscle damage, and metabolic stress, and set forth into the world people uh, exploring these three or attempting to explore these three stimulus or stimuli in isolation. We kind of know now that mechanical tension is kind of ruling the roost. Muscle damage might have a deleterious effect on hypertrophy. If you were to kind of put out an updated hey, here's kind of what we think, whether it's a, uh, you know, three across the board, one, two, three, or one thing, and these are the byproducts. From a hypertrophy perspective, mechanistically, what are we looking at? Because, you know, we had like the, we had Milos on the show not too long ago. He'll talk about like hyperemia, and he's obviously big into blood flow. What, what, when you look at the cross-section of research and what's working anecdotally, where do you point your efforts at primarily, secondarily, and ter at tertiary? Okay, so... If we look at what can I do to lay down the most hypertrophy today, right? What's what's going to produce the most protein synthesis? The mechanical tension is ahead by a mile if we're just looking at that window. Um, where the other things come in comes back to do I start to form bottlenecks at a certain point, right? Like if I if I if I focus my programming simply around just maximizing the mechanical tension. Do I get to the point where I start to have a metabolic bottleneck or do I get to a point where actually some of the positive adaptations that come from damage become a bottleneck? Because, you know, there there is overlap in all of these, right? Like if, if we're if we're accruing mechanical tension, we're obviously getting some sort of metabolic stimulus, right? Like where we're expending some energy, but we may not be getting to the same cellular level fatigue you know, if I was directly going after those, because I'd be using maybe different rep ranges, different tempos, different rest intervals, exercise selection, all of those things, right, that we could use to capitalize on basically doing exercises that are intentionally inefficient from an energy system perspective, right, to tax those, like basically to increase the stimulus there and then increase the adaptation. So my philosophy is, is that if your goal is hypertrophy, you should be spending the majority of the time focusing on just how do I accrue the greatest mechanical tension stimulus? But then you should also basically take periods or blocks where you focus on those others so that you eliminate them from being the bottleneck. So the purpose of doing a metabolic phase is not for that phase to be producing the hypertrophy itself, but it's to eliminate any metabolic bottlenecks that would be reducing how much progress you make when you're focusing purely on mechanical tension. The same thing with either, you know, focusing on mechanical damage or, or whatnot, where you're like intentionally like, you know, or, or an overreaching phase, like, okay, can I actually like push the button that is going to give me some of these more like, hey, you know, if I'm 
pursuing mechanical tension, I'm going to get a certain level of muscular damage and inflammation, et cetera, right? If I'm just getting a little bit of those, am I essentially at my recovery limitation for those? So what if I focus on like over stimulating, pushing a little bit too far in that direction so that now when I'm doing my mechanical tension stuff, the inflammation is, oh, that's like nothing. It's very easy for my body to recover. So what I want is I want my metabolic performance and my recovery thresholds to exceed the demands of my tension programming. So what I do is I have my mechanical tension phase go for a while, and then I pay homage to those other adaptations to remove those. And I look for signs that those potentially could be starting to become weak points because there's also a like we're still stuck in the real world where we have to get a certain amount of performance in a certain amount of time, right? So you can't just keep resting infinitely in between sets, you know, like you, you have to be able to get a certain amount of stuff done. So there's going to be a certain amount of cardiovascular, you know, you know, adaptations that are going to be beneficial, not just to like, okay, performance in the set, but it's going to be, well, how much time do I need between sets? And it's also going to be like, how quickly can my body, you know, switch between fuel sources, you know, when I'm recovering and even, you know, how well do I sleep? So if we neglect those things, it's basically like, you know, one thing starts, you know, falling off at a time until eventually the actual limiter of our hypertrophy program becomes these other things. It's not like, well, how much more? The only re the reason I can't get more hypertrophy stimulus is because I'm so deconditioned into these other things that impact my performance and recovery. Yeah. So you're look. I mean, I guess my question coming out of that would be s s concurrent wouldn't allow you to push the thresholds of the bottleneck. So, you know, the idea of like a deload comes to mind and, and I think deloads are vastly misunderstood. And if I'm understanding the, the conceptual framework here, the idea is you're never deloading, you're reloading a particular potential bottleneck in a phase so that we can really get back to home base and push mechanical tension unfettered. And with the capacity past really what we could enter into that mechanical tension phase with so that we can push mechanical tension without being interrupted by some of these, you know, extraneous bottlenecks. So the deload is not just decreasing mechanical tension, although that might increase your recoverability of the stimulus that is meant to adapt some of these other potential bottlenecks, but you're not meant to throttle those back. You should probably throttle those up in sessions where you're not, uh, or, or in a, in a, in a training block where you're not driving mechanical tension, you should be really trying to drive and push there or spin the plates, if you will, of these other potential bottlenecks. So we can get back to the show, which the show is obviously going to be mechanical tension. Got it. Now, moving from that, and we, we've talked along the timeline of skill a few times. Uh, now we sort of talked um, chronologically across uh, maybe some principles of programming, identifying some key bottlenecks. Um, interset variables you know, we have rest pause sets, we have uh, drop sets, we have um, uh, cluster sets, which you could probably put it with rest pause sets, supersets, things of the like. Efficacy, and we'll probably have to break these down individually, or we'll have to break these down individually. Efficacy, application, you know, fuck, marry, kill, cluster sets, supersets, and drop sets. Yeah, I mean, I think all of those, like, it. I would look at them in terms as like they're different ways of efficiency, right? Like hypertrophy, I still think comes down to the dosage. And these are just different ways of manipulating how much dosage am I getting in a per set or, or window window of time, right? Um, I think, you know, your rest pause variations, I would probably put at the, at the top of, of those things because you're able to work at the higher intensity and manage progressions and stuff. Like I think both in terms of practical application and the fact that it's probably the, it's very good for hypertrophy and also very good for strength kind of makes that one like maybe kind of the leader, right? Um, you know, whereas drop sets, you're continuing to work at lower and lower intensities over time, you know? And so for that, it's not going to have as much application for strength, but might still equally be good as an efficiency product for uh, hypertrophy. But, you know, you could look at one being one being a little bit more on the metabolic scale and one being a little bit more on the neurological, like, you know, you know, strength development scale. So 
what what may be priority for one may be a different for another athlete depending on how they need to be able to express that you know if they have something on top of just just hypertrophy right and then uh, it also comes down to you know what what's feasible for the exercise right so to me like so when i t when i teach these methods um I teach small nuances, but one of the most important things and like the first thing that you should just do is just eliminate the options that would suck. Right. So like if I'm, do if I'm doing, you know, if I'm doing squats, you know, am I going to do a drop set? Like, am I going to rack it and then go pull some plates and like, and then rack it and then, like, you know, or am I just going to like stand, you know, take a couple deep breaths and then hit another rep, you know, or am I going to do a cluster where I could do a couple reps, take 20, like, basically it's like, okay, why don't we just do the one that would practically suck the least knowing that all of these are essentially just ways of trying to get more stimulus in fewer total sets. Right. And that, that's kind of like how I look at it is like, that's the first thing. And then maybe you only have one option for the exercise anyway. So who cares? I love the NASCAR pit crew effort. I love it. I love, I love the whole production. You're bringing in a G a spot. No, I don't need a spot. I need you to ready. Wait for it. I need you to peel plates, peel plates. Yeah, training, I, and I think it's, you know, the real world application training economy is so often lost in the sauce when, you know, we see stuff on social media, like the idea of a drop set in a pin loaded machine. I'm there. I'm there for it. Hold on, reels. Done. Great. Brilliant. Juji's got those things where if you drop it fast enough, they explode out like a firework, like a Roman candle. Yeah, training, uh, training economy is interesting. And I think the one thing too that might come to like, with our ability to tolerate, I mean, really it comes down to like, I guess, tolerate pain is one thing that coincides with the ability to stay in a good position of exercises that are, and maybe you don't choose exercises that aren't externally stabilized to do cluster sets in. But we see compensation exist in low skilled athletes as they look to more quickly recruit tissues on a chest press machine. But, you know, maybe the one variant that I see is like hmm, cluster sets versus drop. If the idea is to prolong uh, the, or the dosage of stimulus, it's one thing that I've often ran into is like, all right, for lesser skilled people, we might lean towards a drop where the tendency to compensate to local or, or sorry, surrounding tissues might be a little bit higher, a little bit sooner if we're trying to keep them under the high, high load of a, of a heavier lift. And then maybe as someone advances over time and they can kind of stay in that uh, coordinated pattern, uh, maybe we look at cluster sets. And that's, that's like, that's the one thing that I look at logically going like heavier weights, higher dose, less skill, more compensation, maybe, maybe in a few months, or maybe if it's even with, like you mentioned earlier, like maybe it's just a few weeks as you get better at this particular movement, right? That learning curve would obviously trend in the presence of external stabilization. The learning curve is going to be higher in exercises that don't have uh, uh, the, the amount of external support or reference. But uh, yeah, it, it's funny because of all the science that you could go down. I like that you pulled it into the practical realm of like, do the thing that doesn't suck. Um, because it's, it is the big picture that I think a lot of people miss and the nuance is a ton of fun, but it's nice to know that like, at the very least, we're not promoting the pit crew behavior of peeling plates. Like, Oh, geez.